So yeah. Hi, welcome back to another edition of that Millwall podcast. Um, so we're going to do a preview of Nottingham Forest at home this weekend. Uh, I'm joined by my usual co-host, the one and only Omar. Good Hi. evening. Evening, pal. You all right? Yeah, not too bad. Sorry, Omar and Willow. <laughs> yeah, she'll be floating around in the background. <laughs> we're joined by the, we're joined by our normal um, co-host, I suppose. He's been on enough shows now, and our football guru, Kai. How you doing, fella? I'm good, thank you, mate. Looking forward to it. Should be a good chat. Cool, cool. You look really tiny on the screen, fella. You look like you're just l- lounging around, and it looks as if like you are the youngest of the bunch by leaning right the way back. So, um, a I bit think of posture. Chair. I think it's a chair. It's, it's, yeah, it's don't make excuses. Hand, good posture, fella. Sit up, right? Come on, we're 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 on for a show here, fella. We've got a professional with us this week. We've got the one and only Dan Marsh. How you doing, fella? Yeah, not too bad, thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad at all, fella. So, um, I suppose you weren't on the last show, so we're. We we'll quickly do a couple of minutes in of um, your catch up with the the Palace uh, game and and how you think we rated there. Yeah, yeah, it was a good game. Um, I think <clears throat> it's just a bit disappointing, really. I thought first half we were good. I didn't think they were that good. Um, and then, well, by the time we got back to our seats, that, that was it, wasn't it? Um, it's just a bit of a shame it, it, their first goal come so quick. Um, I listened to the, the pod you guys did, and um, I think you're right. Like the atmosphere was decent, but I think it could have got to levels, you know, top top levels if that early goal hasn't gone in. Like I think it kills it a bit, and then the other one so soon after. But you know, I think with who we had available and and stuff like you know, we ran them close, and it's one of them things. In the end, I think class probably told a, a little bit of that little spell, and it's just too much at the end of the day, wasn't it? Yeah, fifteen. 15 minutes of premiership quality and um and it was just a bit too much for us, I think. But I think we've um we delve into the palace enough on the last show and I think it was it depressed us enough to think that, you know, it was only only that what really uh destroyed us as such. And um just one thing what I will say, thank you very much to all the palace fans who've been commenting all week on on our Twitter feed and our TikTok feed and everything else. You've made our analytics fantastically well this week. So thanks very much. Um, and keep on commenting because I really don't give a fuck of your opinion. Uh, That's one thing I don't want from Mill, Mickey, you know, because the Premier League culture of online football fans, it's a different species. If you go on to any Premier League club, for various reasons, also they get the attraction from worldwide. But the amount of like tweets behind like hidden AVIs and stuff like that, and it's all like behind football accounts and stuff like that. But it's just a different species that the Premier League you get from interaction on Twitter. It feels like, at least from, you know, in Championship and Mill in particular, it feels like you've got the picture of the person behind the, the post is themselves. But it seems in the Premier League you get all sorts of trolls and different accounts on there, don't you? Oh, unbelievable! I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, you know, if 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 those Palace fans who were tweeting us and um, TikTok and all that, and you know, with the abuse and everything else you've got, you see, the problem is I couldn't really care because. Unfortunately, I've got a button on my side end, and when I look at it, I can press delete. And then your comment on YouTube, your comment on the pod, your comment on TikTok, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, if I think it's bollocks, I'll just press delete. So I don't really care if you you know you could take all the time in the world to make sure that you've worded it right, put your grammar in and everything else. I'll just come along if I think you're a cunt, I'm gonna delete it. So it don't bother me. But keep going because it's making our making our analytics look fantastically well so uh yeah many thanks for that one anyway let's crack on um without further ado we're going to talk about forest do a preview on forest and we'll be back straight after this for part one welcome back um we've got three football knowledgeable people on this today so uh, I'm going to sit back ask the questions and uh, hopefully it'll be a very entertaining show with their football knowledge or it could just be a, a crock of shit um, we'll wait and see if uh, if it is a crock of shit it's their fault not mine I'm just leading the ship so uh, it is what it is so we played 21 matches with um, Nottingham Forest we've won seven they've won six and we've had eight draws that gives us a 33% win rate and then a 29. Um, 
over our, our wins away or, or, or our away wins recently, the last five games, we've had a draw, a loss, a loss, a win and a loss. And they've had a draw, draw um, for, a, for away. They've had a draw, 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 a win and a loss. Um, we'll start with you, Omar. Um, what's your feeling for Saturday? And who are you going to be fearful of going into Saturday? Yeah, I mean, the top team coming to town, to be honest. Obviously, they're fresh off a 1-0 win against Arsenal in the FA Cup. So, I, I mean, I'm expecting, obviously, they're going to be on quite a buoyant move. I think they've sold out their away allocation as well. I think just short of 2,000 fans coming down from Nottingham. So, yeah, it's going to be a tricky game for us. But who am I feared of? I mean, I guess Lewis Grabbin, I suppose. Not necessarily because I think he's a top draw player, but he's obviously coming to the middle against his old club. He scored the winner last Saturday as well. So I think he'd be quite buoyant and keen to try and get one over on the Millwall fans, really. But I'm expecting a close game, to be honest, which I'm sure we'll get into when we're predicting in a bit. But it's going to be probably a tricky one for us. But a bit of a crossroad moment as well, I feel like, in our season. Our form's been a bit kind of iffy of late, but hopefully we can get back to winning ways and have something to play for going into the, the rest of the season. Fingers crossed. No, I agree with you on there. I mean, um, we'll come to you next, Dan, and then come to you, Kai. So, Dan, what's... Um... What's your thoughts of Saturday's game and um, is there anyone you're fearful of? Um, I think Omar pretty much summed it up. Um, <clears throat> they're in some pretty good form, obviously, knocked us out of the cup. Um, I don't think they're, they're too far away from us in the league as well. I think we're, our records are, are pretty similar in terms of points. So, you know, whoever wins is, is going to be in a position to really, really kick on and whoever doesn't. Is probably you know looking at a, a bit of work to do if they want to stand in around that top six. Um, it'd be a good one. I think they've sold out the the away end. Um, they normally travel well uh, down to Den Forest, if, if I remember correctly. In terms of fear, yeah, it's, it's got to be grabbing really, and it? it's it's just inevitable. You know, yeah, always ten happens. Goals, it? Ten goals this season. Um, Not really different, is it? No, and he seems to always manage to do something against us, doesn't he? And he and he loves doing it. Um, but yeah, we'll come back to the players and that in a minute. So, Kai, what's your thoughts on Saturday? And uh, is there anyone you're fearful of? I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach here. I'm looking at their signings they've just made, and I'm quite quite intrigued to see how Keenan Davies does at, at, at Forest on loan from Villa. Um, every time I've seen him play for for Villa, he looked quite a good player, and he looks quite handy. So. Um, you know he'll be he's, he'll be a handful. Um, other than that, Ryan Yates uh, seems to seems to drive the midfield well, uh, forward quite well. Um, saw a couple of quotes earlier in the season from him saying that he wants to change his uh, sort of uh, play that he used to play backwards quite a lot. You know wants to sort of drive forward and, and get through and and pass forward. So he he could be quite a threat as well, especially in the air. He's quite good from corners. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the game. Uh, should be a good one. It should be a good atmosphere. Um, yeah, and just as Omar said, let's hope we can get back to winning ways. They've got quite a good few players, to be fair, Mickey. Like they, they are. Mm. I think they're on an up as well because obviously Steve Cooper or you know Gollum, as we like to call him as well, because obviously he's quite. He's he's My when he's in particular, he struck us a bit as a, an odd looking character. But yeah, I think um, they're tricky sides, and I think obviously since he's come in, obviously his first game was against us earlier in the season. And, but for a fluke goal, maybe we probably should have won that day. Um, it's a hard one, I think. You know, I'm expecting us to compete and hopefully just, you know, kick on and really try and cement our place as trying to push on for the rest of the season, really. Yeah, you've let down the uh, the that Millwall Park podcast bingo players there, um, Omar. You didn't okay. mention the 3 0 win before lockdown. Um, I know. I, I was thinking about it. That's almost two years ago now, but there you go. I know. Oh, you see, you see? He, Omar's still counting the days. Yeah. Yeah. Give me the I days. I earlier subconsciously as well, actually. I can't remember what I was watching. I must have been reading about the preview for the game, thinking, cool, I need two years ago. I was at the city ground watching us win a 3 0. What could have been if it weren't for COVID that year? Honestly, I do still think that yeah. to this day. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. So, I mean, they've got quite a few players. Lewis Graben is obviously always a. Um, What's the word I'm fucking thinking of? He's always nuisance. a bit of a bastard. He's yeah. a nuisance. He's always a bit of a bastard. He's he's always uh, um, a bogey for us, really. And he's sort of like that bogey player. What it will always try and fuck something up for us, either score or provide the assist or or something else. I mean, they've got quite a few half decent players what can score goals. I mean, their top scorers at the moment: Lewis Gavin's on ten, uh, Brennan Johnson five, Philip Zinnenagel four, Lyle Taylor, 
who we'll come back to in a in a while. Who's there, there was loads of speculation along Twitter yesterday that he was possibly part of a a swap deal for them getting Jed Wallace, which I really hope is just a rumor. Uh, he's on free, and then they've got Jack Colbeck and Ryan Yates on two. But I mean, looking at the our scorers, I mean Bradshaw's on seven, a is on five, Wallace on five, Wallace on two. Uh, Murray Wallace, Jake Cooper's on two, and Daniel Ballard on one. Um, so, you know, we've got a few what could hopefully score, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, my question to you boys, knowing that you, you boys have got all the knowledge and and I just watch fucking 11 people run around a pitch, what <laughs> formation do you think Gary's going to play tomorrow? Um, or not tomorrow, tomorrow if you're listening tomorrow, but yeah, on Saturday against Forest. I'll let one of the boys go first. But we'll go Dan first. Um, I reckon he'll probably stick with the shape against Palace. I think with Murray Wallace back in, um, that makes sense. He's done really well in the wing back role. Um, I feel a bit sorry for Scott Malone. He he had a storming season last year, and it was always going to be a bit difficult. I think for for him to to match that this year. But I think part of the reason he's been left out. I don't think it's a slight on him. I don't obviously not hit the, the heights he did last year, but I think it's more down to how good Wallace has done. Um, I think, bearing in mind they're in good form, like I say, since Steve Hooper's come in, you know, he's, he's transformed them. Like, it feels like, literally, I had to do a double take earlier when I looked and they were they were winless in, at the start of the season. They were rock bottom. Um, it's insane. But yeah, that, that's how I think he'll go. I think... The main thing at the minute is, like you just touched on, Mickey, with the, the goal scorers, Bradshaw and a phobia, keeping them two together. And I think the, the best way for him to do that will, will probably be sticking with that shape. So what so what formation are you going for? So the back five. So 5-3-2, five, 5-2-3 two, five, two, with OJ behind. Right, OK. Omar, what's your, your views, formation and, and tactics for Saturday? Well, I mean, I know what I want, but I think okay, it probably will be. Want? A, I want a back four personally. Yeah. I want well, four, the four, two. I want, yeah, not necessarily. It has to be four four two in that case. Obviously, you want Bradshaw and a phobia up top, but I want us to try and go for the game a bit more. But I know Forest play a back five, um, and typically when teams play that formation, we tend to match them up, and I expect us to do that. Um, again, you, you never know. I think obviously the quite a good strength for Forest anyway. I feel like they've strengthened with Steve Cook as well from Bournemouth, who's a centre half. And if you look at about three of Warrell, McKenna and uh, Cook, they're both really good at this level for championship level. So I think they're going to be a threat. But that's why I'd like to see us maybe go for a 4 4 2 and try and cause them problems and stretch them into the wide areas. But that's just my personal preference. It's it's obviously a, a scenario where it's if you want to take the game to them or try and manage the game and try and still be in it. And it's probably going to be the latter. Um, but I, I wouldn't be opposed to about five, but I'd just like to see us maybe go 4 4 2 and go for it, to be honest. And even stick Tyler Bury on on the right hand side, just kind of throw a spanner in the works a little bit, and maybe give you know the fans something to kind of get behind and something different to kind of try and drive the team on a little bit. Kai, um, I, I, and I think five three two. Um, I just think he'll probably stick with the same one as Palace. Um, I thought we did well. I mean, going to Omar's four at the back, I thought that you know he did switch it up and go four at the back when he took Pierce off. And to be honest, I didn't think after that palace causes any problems so it does show sometimes we can go back four and have still have no problem so um you know it would be nice to see a back four see us go a bit more attacking a few uh two wingers Bury, as you said it'd be interesting um maybe even bring boating on later on in the game that'd be nice to see as well um but i think you'll probably stick with back five um and then probably play three in the midfield because i thought ojo had a good game the other day so he definitely deserves uh, deserves to start um and hopefully he can cause forest a few problems along with the two up top because they're, they're in they're in great form I just think it'd be interesting, like to have. So imagine you got Ojo on the left, for example, and Murray Wallace at left back. Then you got a out and out wing on the right and Bury or something, and it's a four four two with the sole aim of like just trying to cause them problems and up the pitch and almost play like a four two four and just kind of give them a game. Um, obviously, then you've run the risk of getting out right in the middle, but I don't know. I just think I feel like we're at a point where we know we're probably going to be safe in the championship. You're never safe till you're safe, but I just like to see us maybe try and do something a bit different and see what these players are made of. You know, we keep talking about we've got the youth players. Um, and I think, you know, we saw on Saturday when they came on, it lifted the crowd. 
Maybe it's maybe not to play Bury, maybe bring him on to sub, but I'd like to see us at some point in the game at least just go for it on Saturday. I, I just feel like it'd be something different to watch and something for the fans to get behind. Because our home form's actually quite good aside from the Palace game. I don't think we've lost since the Luton game um, when obviously Harry Cornick scored them two good goals. But it's just obviously it's quite, I think it's going to be a challenge Saturday to be honest. And I'm, I'm not expecting the worst, but I do think it will do well to get a result against them. I totally agree. I think we should go for it. I think how we played against Palace um, on Saturday just gone, I think that's probably the best we've played in a long while. And to be able to hold our own like we did for as long as we did with a premiership team um, shows that things are going in the right direction. But part of me has got this fear that we're just going to go back to, you know, proven, trusted um how he plays and we're not going to get, but I would want to see the youth he's brought in, you know, Lovelace, um, Nana and, and obviously um, Bury on at some point on the game to try and see what these guys are, are capable of. Um, but as on, on positioning, you might as well just stick your fucking finger in the air, mate. It, it'll be whatever he decides on the day, and then he change it, and then he change it again, and it and it don't really matter because what happens is is that you know actually that's a question for you in a bit, but Mill just seem to you know it, it it whatever we think they're playing when you look at Sky or BBC or any of the other football channels as such, everyone seems to have a different understanding of what formation we're playing, so. If if they don't know what's playing, then fucking fuck knows if we know what he's going to be playing. Do you know what I mean? He's quite reactive instead of proactive. That's the only criticism I've got really at the minute. I'd just like to see us try and give them something to worry about instead of us just trying to manage the game. It, you can't knock it because look, we are where we are on the table. We're we you know we're solid in this, in this league. But I mean, I guess maybe a question to Dan, I suppose. But like, do you find that? It, when uh, Mickey's saying there about the unpredictable nature of the team, I suppose it's a, fl- a fluid nature as well. But is it a niche, do you think, to have a couple of formations up your sleeve? Or maybe we should have one set way of playing? Or I don't, I don't know how you read it, Dan. I think so. I think one thing I personally thought towards the end of Harris's reign was that you could kind of name the team on the back of your hand. It would be 4 4 2, it would be the same personnel. I think a lot of teams in our league have the ability to mix it up within games. And I think that's something that Brown's spoken quite a bit about. I think it is a part of modern football, having that, you know, more than just one trick up your sleeve. Um, so, yeah, I, I can see the benefits. Um, and it definitely feels like lately we've kind of tinkered between that back five to four, three, three. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's, it's kind of a given now. I, f- I feel like most teams do it. Have we're you spoken to Go on, go on, Mickey, go on. No, go on, go on, go on. I think we're quite fluid, though, in a weird way. Like, I think we stumbled across it. I know the form's been a bit patchy in the last five to ten games, but I feel like there's times where we're watching it in the stand and I'll be next to Mickey, for example, I'll go, I think we're playing about four. And then he'll go, no, someone else go, I think we're playing about five. It's, I think the perks of having the likes of Malone in there or Murray Wallace at left-centre half is you can kind of shift it, can't you, a little bit. I mean, it makes it a little bit more fluid to watch. And like you said, I suppose, manage the game a bit more that way. Yeah, definitely. There's been, sorry, sorry. There's, no, no, been go on, a, go on. there's been times where, you know, you can't tell if Malone's playing left wing back or left winger. I think with the two formations we have, you can have that. You can have that fluidity. You can just drop back or, or push forward, which is obviously handy to have rather than if you want to change your shape, you've got to put square pegs in round holes or make a couple of changes to be able to tweak it. Do you, I mean, just before I ask this question, I like the way Omar makes it sound as if actually I knew what was going on by going, yeah, yeah. When I was standing next to Mickey in the stadium, somebody else said, I felt it... like I was using it as an example. It was, it was like, it was like, oh, right, he's being nice about it. No, no, no. Yeah. It's just, it's just publicly put me up. And Maybe more if I'm bottom. talking to you and mention it, then someone else turns around and goes, actually, hang on. But I suppose, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. But yeah, I mean, have you, <laughs> nothing like having, you know, friends and enemies and all that lot. Anyway, um, <laughs> have you, you Obviously, you've you probably interviewed Gary. Um, I mean, have you ever asked him about what's his preferred formation or does he just not really have one? It's just depending who the opposition is on a day. I have not asked him personally, but I know from reading a couple of bits this year that it's come up. Um, I know he was more... I think it's more 
fo- drawn on towards how we play rather than what shape we play in. I know um, a couple of months back, just before the first international break, maybe where where we beat Blackpool, there was a big thing about wanting to be on the front foot more at home, and I think it does come down to that. Like I, I can't the the specific game is escaping me, but I remember there was one game where we actually started with a back four. And I think we were pretty awful. And we then changed to a back five and we were really, really good. And I remember people coming away and saying, so we, you know, a back five doesn't have to be negative. We can, you know, take it to people in this shape. It does, I suppose, depend more on that than than the shape, especially because it is so fluid. And, you know, moving one player like Wallace or Malone can literally change the shape as simply as that. But, I, no. yeah, to go back to your point, I don't think he's got... A, a personal preference. That's, that's not the impression I've got. Kai? Uh, what about uh, formations and stuff? Um, no, I think, I, I think, um, I, I think as Dan said, it's quite, before he said, you know, it's quite important to be able to switch it up and stuff and, you know, be able to have that, you know, fl- uh, flexibility in the side to do it. And, you know, Malone and Murray do that really well by being able just to sort of confuse opposition by one minute playing back five and then one minute, Malone's, you know, running through the midfield. And the other day against Coventry, I think Maloney might even come on as a centre midfielder, I think, at one point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, like he was playing quite central. So, it's it, you know, we have quite a lot of players in the in the team that, that, that are quite, you know, flexible and, that, you know, can play anywhere, really. And we've seen that with Ryan Leonard, who can play quite a few different positions. I think that's quite important in the team as well, just to also be able to uh, confuse the opposition. Do you think that he's looking at trying to... I suppose in the real world, it'll be a multitask. You know, people who can do multiple um, operations or multiple jobs as such. Do so you think he's trying to get a few players who can who can play different roles and trying to mould them into there so that he can be more fluid on the pitch rather than keep having to change the formation every two minutes? He, he's got people who can just drift out or, or play slightly different positions, Omar? I think he's got a set of staff play that he wants to try and play, like Dan was saying. Um, I remember we were listening to an interesting... I think when they were in Scotland, Joe Carnell's assistant manager was on the Wall Talk podcast, just a 20-minute segment. And he said, like, before we came to Mill, before we got a job, we was always studying how we want to play. And this is, like, I guess how they want to try and bring it in. But I do sometimes question whether we've got the players to play the way they want to. Because if you listen to them talk about it, it's like, you know, we want to have wing-backs bombing on. And we're slowly getting there. You're starting to see progress of it. But... Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. I think it's interesting Dan mentioned the game where we tried to play four at the back. I think it was Reading. In the first half, we played four back four. It was a bit rubbish. Second half, we absolutely just bombarded them, basically, in the second half and won the game 1-0. And it's like, that's when we changed to back five. So, yeah. Um, what was your question again? Because I completely went completely on tangent there. <laughs> I've got no idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got... This is con- valuable content. I've got... I mean, I've got no idea, mate. What, what I can't even think. Oh, um, oh, that was it. Do you think that he's looking to multitask players? Yeah, um, I think so. So that they that. can play in slightly different roles, so that then he doesn't necessarily have to change roles. He can he can make signs to say, you know, you come deeper or you you drop out wide, and then try and play it in that way. I mean, my knowledge of other championship teams is quite limited, but I think we're one of the most versatile teams in the league. You think of Ryan Leonard; he can play four or five different positions. Bennett can play pretty much anywhere, left, right, up front. Um, a lot of, like, even Billy Mitchell could play right back. Murray Wallace could play centre-half, left back. I think we're quite a versatile team by nature. Um, even Savile can do a job at left wing back, they've said. And Mahoney, they've, they've spoke about before. So, I do think he wants an adaptable team, um, especially with COVID and stuff like that. And smaller squ- we've got a smaller squad at Mill. I think he does want that. Um, so, yeah, we do have a kind of versatile bunch, but... I wonder at times whether we're kind of too kind of versatile maybe and just need, I don't know, certain talisman players in certain positions at times. Do you think... Uh, do you think that the... the uh, be careful how I word this. With um, Pierce obviously played the last two games, do you think that you can see his captaincy? Because we've had this conversation before in a pod. Do you think that you can see his captaincy when he's on the pitch or... Is Hutch a better captain on the pitch? Who's that to? Uh, all three of you. We'll start with you, Omar. Uh, I think, yeah, you can you can see what he's brought back is kind of organisation. He's constantly communicating with the back line. And I do sometimes think at times we're missing that, like that kind of communication in the back line. So, 
yeah, I think he is a leader from the, all through the team, really. Excuse me for a second whilst I disappear. But go on, Kyle, I'll hand it over to you this one. Um, no, I think I think Pierce is a great captain. I think he's a great person to have in the in the dressing room at least, you know, like in terms of you know, leadership. Um, you know, and he has that authority, I feel like, but he has like a balance. Um, a lot of interviews that, that the players say they reckon that he has a balance, you know, as well as leadership. He's you know, they, they one of the I think it was Jed who said it, one well, he's one of the funniest guys that he's ever met. Um you know, and he, and he comes across that, like, you know, that, that classic clap he, he comes out to with the, with the middle fans. I think he does just sort of, you know, I, I think Pierce is a fantastic captain. And, you know, even though Hutchie obviously takes it when Pierce isn't, isn't captaining, I think Hutch is, is I reckon he's, he's a good captain as well. And you can see he's vocal, but I think Pierce is probably that little bit more vocal on the pitch. Um, but it just depends whether you want to, um, you know, have a little bit more, maybe, you know, with Hutch, Murray, Wallace and Cooper, maybe you've got that little bit more composure at the back. Or whether you want to have a leadership quality in Pierce, who you know I think is priceless to have at least in the dressing room for the for encouragement. Dan, yeah, I think Same he does. Um, <laughs> I feel like Silla Black. Sorry, I feel like Silla Black doing blind dates. You know what I mean? Contestant number three. Same question to you. I think he does. Yeah, I, I'm not sure in terms of whether um, it was planned for him to come back in recently or whether the the kind of COVID cases have have forced Rout's hand, but. I think in terms of him coming back in, it's probably a decent time for him to come back in because I know a couple of games last year, you know, wasn't his, his finest hour, but we've not been, you said at the start of the show, the, the goal scoring, I feel like this year, although we, you know, we don't need new net to the Denny's, I'm saying, I feel like scoring is less of an issue, and whereas this year is keeping them out. Don't see as many one nils or, or, or nil nils of a minute by our standards, we've been quite leaky this year. Um, and Pierce, the time of him come back in for a couple of games has probably worked quite well for us. I know it's not necessarily translated into clean sheets. Like the the, the second half at Bristol was was a bit of a nightmare. But I, I think given that we've not been up to our usual standards defensively, being able to bring someone like him in, in terms of his organisation leadership is, is a plus. He done himself no disjustice at Coventry. I think that was his best game I can remember yeah, for a long time. You know, he came back in and steered us to a 1-0. And I think Dan's right there, Mickey. Like, clean sheets are just an issue. I think, what, four or five this season, which is very subpar for a middle team. Why do you think that we've suddenly gone on to not being able to keep clean sheets this season compared to last then, Dan? I don't know. I'd love to be, love to be able to tell you. I do know. I, it's not even... Because, like I said, we... I don't think scoring goals is an issue this year, but I wouldn't say we've abandoned kind of our stability for all that attack. Um, it, it just seems to be down to it. I think there's, a, there's been a lot of individual errors this year. Um, a few people, I, I'd argue probably everyone in that defence has probably had a spell this year where they've not been in the best form. Um, and maybe that has contributed, whereas before I feel like last season maybe even the season before if other people were having a bad game you could rely on that back four or five and bark to bow you out whereas this year i'd argue that all of them have probably had their moments you know where they've not covered themselves in in, in glory no yeah no i sort of agree i mean i think the communication on that on that back line is is probably not as good as what it was last season or, or the season before because you can see that there's a few times where the errors have occurred where people think other people should be getting it and they're not. Um, I mean, it might even be a stylistic thing, Mickey. So it's playing there. Like Danny Mack is, he's quality on the ball. Maybe at times, you know, if you had Romeo there, he's a bit more, I'd say he wasn't necessarily a defensive minded fullback, but I think at times maybe, you know, changing the back line and the kind of obviously Malone playing left wing back at times, you don't really have that, you know, hardcore back five. It's more like kind of fluid where everyone they're trying to get forward and get more involved. So I do think it's like a balancing act. Um and yeah, I think at times like that can be an issue where you commit more bodies forward and that's what happens. Do you also think that possibly that some of the some of the players don't necessarily are quick enough to run back? We've got a few players what would chase balls down. But are, is everybody as committed as running back as possibly they were last season or the season before? 
Uh, maybe one for Clive that one, but I think that's a bit. Of, I don't. Right. I think that's a that's a I, thing. I, I it's think, more I think throw bodies forward. I think that's it. But they all put an effort in. I think. I think my theory behind the the lack of clean sheets this year. I just feel like we've had so many injuries in the back line. They haven't been able to you know discover a proper uh, partnership and you know like the connection between all three. We saw start of the season. Cooper had a back like back injury for the first game. Hutch was out for quite a few weeks. Ballard's now been out for quite a few weeks. Um, Murray Wallace has had spells on the sidelines as well, and they haven't been able to really form a form a partnership. I feel like, and last year, I know we had Hutchinson at the end of the year. That you know, he was out for four or five weeks, but most of the time last year, they they had, we had a pretty settled back line in terms of injuries. They might miss the odd game, but they didn't miss you know a lot. The players when we've had players out, we've they've missed four or five weeks. I think that can take some time to get a partnership together. I think Daniel Ballard was excellent when he came in. And then obviously now he's out, you know, it take him probably some time again to, to form that partnership back again when he comes back. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's down to the fact that they've, they've, they've been out for, some of them have been out for quite a few weeks. He could be coming back at the right time though, couldn't he, Ballard? Yeah. For us to make a final push. I mean, if he, if he comes back and helps secure up the back line. Um, when is, when's Le- is Leonard still injured? Yeah. I think When's he's... he back? Do we know? I think it's a similar kind of time as, as Ballard, maybe next month. So, I mean, you know, beginning of February, if we can get Leonard and Ballard back, um, it could be at the right time for us potentially to to possibly, you know, get a few clean sheets and make a, a drive up the table possibly. Um, I know it's a pipe dream and everything else, but um, if we can get – they, they are – they are very valuable to our team, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, maybe um, more of a question needs to be what we can do this window to strengthen. I mean, seeing as we've got Dan on here, we might as well try and pick his brains to see if there's anyone that's, uh, you know, any rumours come true. Or if, I mean, what do you reckon, Dan? Are we, well, I know we're in the market for a couple of attacking players, especially midfield area. Um, is there anything, you know, maybe you can share with us that maybe when you speak to Rowett, you can kind of get an idea of his ideas for January? There's nothing concrete kind of flying about at the minute. I think other than the kind of, like you said, we've been linked with a couple of attacking midfielders. That's definitely an area I think they want to strengthen. Um, I think for me, the, the thing I've been encouraged with so far in this window in terms of who we've been linked with is it feels like a different profile of player. Um, I think whether it's this window or the summer, it's obviously looking quite unlikely that Jeddy's going to stay. So, part of that is down to planning for life without him I, I'm I'm assuming but the fact we're looking into that European market we're looking into younger players a bit of resale value um for me that's kind of what I want to see as as a fan that kind of encourages me and then when you add that with the kind of youngsters we've come in through I, I think I said a few weeks ago I can't really remember the last time maybe when we first went down to League One um under Chopper where we had quite a few kids kind of on the cusp of the team. But I feel like because we went down, our hand was kind of forced a bit there anyway. Like, it feels like a while since we've had a good four or five people. I saw another uh, Dan Moss went out on loan to, to Leighton Orient today. Even the loans, like, it feels like a long time since... Has he gone to Leighton now? Yeah, he's gone to Leighton. He was called back from... He was called back when he off from Yeovil. So they've they've shipped him out to a, a yeah, national league team today. now. Very stepped yeah. up to the league too now. Yeah, but which I think is great for him because he is. He, I think he's going to be a formidable player in the future. Hello, who directs it today? Oh, is that what it is? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone who wants to answer that fucking question, this is getting hard. I've not now. seen Dan Moss play. I know Kai's watched the twenty ones a few times or twenty three, shall I say? Kai, have you seen, what do you reckon of Moss? Have you seen him uh, play before? Well, I think he's a good player. And I think again, going back to the versatile player that that. I reckon Raul, well, we've seen Raul bring in players like Evans and Leonard and stuff. Well, obviously, Leonard was brought in under Harris, but a player like Evans, for example, um, you know, I think Moss really does fit that category. I think he can play centre back, can play a right back, and you, I've, you know, I've even heard him play. I even heard he's played at, at centre midfield. He's had a he had a really good loan spell at, at Yeovil, um, which was good. A lot, lot of fans were glad to see him go, which is always a good sign. Um, and now he's under Kenny Jacket, which is. You know he'll know the he'll know what exactly what what Mill will want out of our player. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him in the future. He's a he's definitely one to watch. 
did you see the replies to that? He done a tweet saying when he left the Oval. One of them even one of the fans even said, "I'll go out on a limb and say you'll be in the Premier League in three years' time." So I mean, obviously it's different bars at different levels, but he's obviously going to be sorely missed down at the Oval. Definitely, Dan. What's your views on on some of the youngsters and stuff, especially on Dan Moss? Yeah. Like I said, I think we've got a really good crop coming through. Um, I watched the under twenty threes the other day. Um, I not... mentioned the score. <laughs> no, no, I won't mention the score. <laughs> I've um, I've not really seen much of the twenty threes, to be honest. It's only really because I've got a couple. The odd week now, I'll have the odd day off in the week. Um, I'm hoping to to get to see a bit more of them, but you know, from what I've seen, you know, further likes of. You know, go back to Lovelace at 15, 16 to be in a position. I know COVID has played a part, but, you know, to have lads like that on our bench, you know, is, is something which I don't think we've had for a few years. And traditionally, Millwall teams are at their best when there's a core of players who have come through our academy there. So I think it's promising, but you need to get the blend right. You know, one thing to consider is, I know, um, hopefully it looks like Bradshaw is going to be staying, but there's going to be a massive overhaul in the attacking area going into next season. Because obviously you've got John Daddy out of contract, Smith out of contract, Jed um, out, Daddy of contract. Run out of contract. Sorry? When does Dad, when does um, Bod run out of contract? Pretty sure it's this summer. Right, okay. Pretty sure it's this summer. So I think as it stands next year, you're looking at Bury, um, Isaac Alafe is on loan at Sutton, potentially Bradshaw. So I don't think I've missed anyone there. But if I have the point I'm making is we, you know, we're not going to be looking for one or two attackers. You you'd anticipate we'll be looking for quite a few because that's going to be a, a really big overhaul, which when you consider we've not really smashed goals over the last few years, maybe isn't a bad thing. So you mean realistically that we could we could suddenly pick up a couple of these continental players because it's good now that we're scouting overseas. We could potentially pick up a couple of fairly unknown um, overseas players, maybe the likes of this lad who Cherno represents um, from the Belgium side, and, and all of a sudden they could suddenly become on fire for us and and really start smashing goals in because that's what we're missing in it. We need a someone to you know, do 20 goals, 25 goals a season, really, don't we? I think I think for me, I don't know if you guys agree with this, looking at that Palace game, that second half, I said to my brother, for me, what I thought we were missing that day, I know Bradshaw and Benick aren't anywhere near 20 goals, so in an ideal world, if you're being promoted, you do want a 20, 25 goal a season striker. For me, we're still missing, which I thought we were in the summer, that midfielder who can put it all together, you know, <clears throat> Danny Matt was brilliant against Palace, but when we were looking to make something happen in those final 15, 20 minutes, unless we got the ball out to Tyler or Shea, it was Danny Matt driving it. There wasn't really a lot coming centrally. And that's why I was surprised when we bought in Shea on deadline day back in August, because I didn't really think it was another winger that, that we needed. Um, so for me, that's what I'd prioritise. Whether that's a case of this month or the summer, I think for me, you know, Bradshaw's had a tough couple of years. Like he's shown, if he gets the chances, he will score. I remember speaking to him after we got um, the two goals. I can't remember who it was against again. Um, and I said to him, I can't remember the last time in a middle game where a striker's had two chances like that inside the six-yard box. And I think part of that is down to to that creativity and, and creating chances. Yeah, if we can stick the balls in, then we've definitely got people who can who can put them away. Um, but it's just getting those balls. I mean, these guys, I mean, Omar, you've said before, haven't you, that we need like a creative midfielder who, who can make things happen. Yeah, I think um, Saturday what killed the game was Savile going off injured. I think that was a big mm. kind of twist in the, in the game. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think Mitchell has the ability to do that. But I do think, yeah, like a, a creative outlet. I think that's why Ojo's done well in the 10 when he played there. I think, you know, Bristol City, obviously, when he played through a phobia and stuff like that, I do agree with Dan there, though, like, maybe a bit more kind of an industrious box-to-box -box midfielder that can, you know, create and contribute goals as well. I mean, Savile and Mitchell haven't really scored many goals this season either. So, you know, you, you had three of the top goal scorers there earlier. There was no midfielder in there. Um, I wonder if that's something that needs to be addressed as well, maybe. 
yeah, we need Savile back to his old self, don't we, really? Um, just before we do finally end part one and move on to part two, my question, I suppose, while you're here, Dan, is um, Jed Wallace. Um, two questions, really, but the first one would be, um, are we gearing up over the last few games? I know he's been injured, but are we gearing up for life without him? And the second part to that question is, do you think Jed Wallace is a legend? Injured, by the way. <laughs> I, think it. It. <laughs> I think, I think, yeah, potentially we've probably been gearing up for life about him. Um, whether that was intentional or not, I, because we've had the cancel games for a life now, I can't remember when he got injured. Um, but I think, you know, the forest interest isn't going away. He, unless we go up, I think it's very unlikely, you know, that, that he stays. I think that's been made pretty clear. So for me, I think if I was offered the choice, I think I probably would try and cash in this month if I'm a if I am the club, purely yeah, because, of, like I said, <laughs> purely because of, like I said, there's going to be that big attacking overhaul over the next six months. For me, I think rather than watch him go for for nothing, it's a gamble for him, though, isn't it? Sorry? Because it's a gamble for him. Because say yeah, say yeah. this week, next week, before the window <clears throat> shuts or whatever, he goes to Forest, and we make some great signings in this window. And we make a full-on push and say, you know, it happens. We we suddenly make a run and we're in the playoffs. And in a dream world, we make the Prem. It'd be a right kicking the bollocks for him, wouldn't it? If he goes yeah. to Forest and, and they're in a championship and we're suddenly, you know, up in the Premiership. I, I, let's, before people comment and everything else, I'm not saying we are going to do that in any shape or form. But I'm just saying, you know, if... By miracles, everything went around us. It would be a right kick in the bollocks for him, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it's a massive gamble. I think, you know, for him, in terms of what he could probably get, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but I'd imagine, you know, for him, he'd have more leeway at the end of the season. You can kind of take your pick. I think if he were to move this month rather than in the summer, that probably, well, it would benefit us because we'd get something for yeah. him. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a massive gamble. Unless, you know, he's, I feel like he's been quite open that. It, it's about he wants to test himself at the top level. So you why know, go to Forest? That is the that is a million dollar question. I mean, it is. It's, it, I mean, <laughs> one thing I, I would say in his defence, to be fair, I mean, if you look at the early moves this month, I think Forest and Middlesbrough have shown real ambition. Um, I think if you're looking at at what's been done, you know, they're obviously going to give it a go this second half of the season. Maybe that plays into his part. I mean, it is a gamble because they might go up. But in terms of size of clubs in this league, you know, Forrest are right up there. I think, like you say, you, you've got it spot on. It is a gamble, but it's, it's down to him if, if he thinks it's one that's, that's worth taking. You boys got any, anything before we look to end on part one? No? Last question then of part one, Dan. Is Jed Wallace a Millwall legend? Don't think so. Not, so. not personally, not for me. Yeah, not for me. But I can understand why people would put him in that bracket. I mean, growing up, one of my favourite players was Paul Ifill. And I think when you look at Jed's returns, I mean, I've not got him to hand comparing them to, to Ifills, but I'd imagine they are a lot better. Um, but I don't think... Maybe it's one of them things, maybe when he's gone... People will look back and, and they'll think differently. But, I, yeah, no, I don't think legend is um, maybe a, a bit too far for me personally. I fully agree with you. Well, look, that's the end of part one. We're going to be coming back with part two where it's um, we're going to be talking about Steve Kavanagh's statement and the MSC statement and, um, and just really have a discussion around that. Yeah. So... Um, just wait there and we will be back in a second. See you soon. Right then, uh, welcome back part two. <coughs> um, in case you haven't seen it, 
it will be in the bio. So if you are looking on YouTube, I am pointing below to the description and the bio. And if you're watching, if you're listening to us on a pod on your morning commute, it will be in the show notes. Uh, we will post a link to Steve Kavanagh's uh, statement, and we will post a um, a link to obviously the MSC statement um, a- as well. So Steve Kavanagh released a statement, um, pretty much uh, a good few positives. Um, we can go into it in a minute, but to me, it felt like it was a school teacher writing a school report. You know, you can try harder, you, you know, um, you know, you, you were disappointed, but you can try harder. I mean, is that how how you three took it? We start with you, Omar, and go round, and then we come back with some other questions. Don't be a tosser, Mickey, God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I think it had to be done, obviously, because it's what the club have to do. They have to kind of carry on. Um, and they have to try and be seen to come out and talk about, obviously, what happened at the weekend and condemn it. Yeah, some strong words in there. I think you know, I think a lot of people will agree with it. A lot of people will disagree with it. It's it's just the difficult thing is, is like, follow me all for me has always been a against the trend thing of what's in modern day football. And we're a working class football club that... You know, so ever since I was a kid at at school, it's always you've always been tarnished with the same brush being a Millwall fan. In a weird way, it's a kind of a guilty pleasure though being a Millwall fan for that reason for me. Um, and it's like I don't really think of it that way, but when I do kind of deep it and think about that, I'm like, you know, Millwall. I have a chip on my shoulder because I'm Millwall, and I don't want to move away from that. But at the same time, I suppose you, there needs to be some sort of leeway and some sort of middle point where the club and the fans are on the same page, I guess. And yeah, strong words from Steve and. You know, I'm sure it's pissed off a lot of people through it. Kai? I, I, I'd probably say similar to Omar. I mean, since I was younger, you know, you always get comments at, at school, um, whether that's primary, secondary, college, whatever. Um, you walk down the street wearing a middle hat and people give you, you know, strange looks. And that that for me, that's that's what we are. You know, no one likes us. We don't care. And that's that's how that is how I feel as a middle fan. Um, and I quite, to be fair, so I, I agree with Omar. I quite enjoy it. I quite enjoy that um, underdog mentality that... Um, you know that working class football club, and you know I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way with Millwall. You know I love my club, and you know it, that doesn't matter what anyone says. I I'll, I'll always be I'll always feel the same about Millwall. So yeah, it's as it's, as I must say, it's a, long, it's a strong statement. But um, yeah, there were some positives in there with the with the atmosphere. I thought the atmosphere was we obviously we said touched in on last show. I thought the atmosphere was good. Um, yeah, so yeah, in, pretty much in, in in conclusion, I you know always love my club, and whatever people say about it, never change it. Dan, yeah, uh, like you said, Mick. I think you know the the club have had to 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 put something out. Consider Omar, sorry, not uh, not me. Um, yes, it's a tough one. Like you know, the atmosphere was buzzing. It was you know as it always is for big games. Um, and you know, I feel like the majority of people know what makes us unique, and it's just about you know keeping that, but not going overboard. No, I, I understand to a degree why they've done it. They're preempting um, an FA report coming in. They're probably in the back of their mind is the Everton stuff. I think it's, I think the suspended sentence as such is over. Um, I think it ended last season, but I'm not 100% on there because obviously there was no fans. And again, you don't know what the FA do, but there was that threat of, stand closures and everything else from the Everton game. So I can sort of understand why they had to do it. On a PR point of view, I don't think it was probably the best bit of PR what they've done um, regarding releasing that statement. They should have possibly released that statement on a Sunday because we're getting middle of the week and most of the media is sort of forgotten about it and Boris is leading and, you know, like, you know, hopefully after today with, with Arsenal, Liverpool, with the Arsenal player being sent off again, it will probably change the the papers slightly towards that. Um, I just think possibly on a PR side, but it was certain, certain parts of the statement, um, you know, I... What takes me back, you know, it, it's... The Zampa Kids area, great. All right, yeah, great. Spend money. Unfortunately, 
it's in the wrong area. So it doesn't matter how much you spend on there. It's still in the wrong area. To me, it should be lower tier. And I would love them to suddenly say, right, we're moving it back down to lower tier, put that back up for open, you know, season tickets, everything else, people sitting up there. Because I think the idea of kids going to football should be able to get signatures and, and get sign-ins and everything else. Tucking them up out of the way doesn't benefit anyone for the future fan base. Um, the ticket office charge, that's well overdue. There's been a number available for forever and a day. Um, it's just that, you know, they don't really publicise it. And I think this has just um, stemmed it. I made my um, concerns clear um, over the ticket in. Um, with people being charged large amounts of money. Um, when it was published, you know, 7.30 in the morning, I sent a, a message over to say, you know, that what's going to happen? This has got to change. And by later on the afternoon, uh, it's been changed, which is great. It's fantastic. Um, the recast thing, I think, is great. Um, getting out of I follow, if we go through the statement where it is, I mean, I think personally, I think getting out of I follow is probably a plus. Um, because it means that the club can generate more money for themselves rather than having to to pay um, large amounts of money into uh, the EFL and I follow because I think they get the the fan money, but I don't think they actually make anything from the advertising revenue and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's no real benefit to them on that side of it. Um, the Crystal Palace match is what it is. The problem is you have these big games and. For the week before, you've got managers and the club and everyone else getting involved on social media, calling for a hostile environment. You can't have both. You can't have that hostile environment and then suddenly moan about it afterwards. Yes, I agree. There's a line. To, there's a line to walk down, and majority of fans don't cross that line. Um, throwing bottles and all that lot. I've got. I've got no idea why people do that. Um, and, and probably you boys haven't, but I mean, do you agree with me that if you if you ask for a hostile environment and you get the hostile environment, it's sort of counterproductive afterwards if you moan that it was too hostile, Dan? To a degree, I think, like you said there, but the key fact is, like I said a minute ago, like I feel like. The vast majority of, of Millwall fans know where that line is. Um, and it's about making sure that that isn't crossed because then it just kind of dilutes it. No, I agree. Kai? Yeah, I think obviously Palace game is always going to be a uh, big game. We haven't played them for a number of years. And there's always going to be hostile atmosphere. I think, you know, I'll probably echo the words of you, Mickey, in terms of, you know, they're, you're going to you have a hostile atmosphere. And then I think the managers and the players do sort of, um, you know, they, they sort of fuel the fire a little bit in the way that they you, they hype the game up and everyone's excited. I was last yeah. Friday night for the game. Um, I was really excited and the players are coming out saying, you know, looking forward to the atmosphere. Gary Rout comes out, looking forward to the atmosphere, want to make it hostile and stuff. And then following the game, Danny Matamara puts a tweet out and says something like the Den, wow, um, you know, to show how good the atmosphere was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a balance they have to try and find. But um, with the big games, you're... It's, it's a it's, it's a full it's a full house, you know. So it doesn't happen very often, um, you know. And, and that and that's what that that is what that is what happens. Yeah, you probably have to find a balance. But yeah, Omar. Yeah, I just agree. I mean, it is. You got this thing is I agree with Dan. There is a line to it, though, isn't it? Where everyone enjoys the day. So that's the key there in that one. But yeah, but I think Up even like that. I said, like I said earlier, by all standards, it probably was quite a relatively good Saturday anyway. <laughs> in the large, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, to me. <laughs> The statement to to that point, it was like, okay, yeah, okay, fair enough. You know, loads of good news, loads of good news, which is how the statements work. You know, when when they come from Millwall, it's normally what what's classed as a shit sandwich, just such. So it's good, good, good. Bit of bad in the middle, and good. The don't be a tosser campaign potentially. Um, I sort of lost it to a degree there i don't necessarily think that was probably the right name the right <laughs> i don't know if that was really thought of um yeah i don't don't agree with throwing i've said but i just don't know if 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 that was um the right <laughs> the right wording i mean what do you think on that part of it i know you joked that it would be coming to part two but what's your your thoughts on that omar 
the intentions are right, aren't they? Like for what the club wants to try and do and the damage they they say it's doing, they want to try and see change. I think don't be a toss is very like it's um you're criticizing your own, but also a lot of people take offense to that, I think. So maybe it could have been worded in a different phrase or it's like you say, it's a shit sandwich. Good, 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 bad, 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 bad. So, yeah. Um, to me, it should be, to me, if it, you know, we're not the only club with a problem with bottles um, or objects being thrown on a pitch. Every premiership, you've seen it recently. You've seen it with other clubs and everything else. I would have much preferred that there would have been a campaign across all football clubs addressing this, unless unless something's suddenly going to come out from all all football clubs using this this tag and 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 you know this wording as in don't be a tosser um but it just feels as if we're pandering to we're pandering to people when we're not by far the worst there is a lot more bottles thrown on the arsenal man city game there's been toilet rolls, huh? toilet rolls. yeah yeah why are the fucking hell Talk, actually jumping aside how the fuck do where do people take in the toilet? I mean, I can understand back in the 70s and stuff, people used to take toilet rolls in, but I don't think in modern day I've ever seen someone take a toilet roll and then they've lobbed the toilet roll onto the pitch there. But there was loads and loads of bottles there. I think it's it's something potentially what maybe, you know, needs to be all clubs or, or you know, the FA driven maybe on that one because it's not just us. We're not the worst in there and we, we don't do it very often. Um, but the Palace lad who did it was there. Um and also the fact that allegedly there was a glass bottle thrown. Well, glass is only unless someone's put it in, um, smuggled the bottle in. Glass normally comes from the exec boxes, uh, the exec lounge and stuff. So, oh, Mickey, I'm going to add, Mickey, I'm to add. Um, not normally, I don't know what, what happened with you guys. I don't know whether it was just, just an anomaly and I was just one of the only ones that got it. But um, normally on match days, we're given paper, plastic cups. On Saturday, I was given a bottle and a lid. So that, I thought that was a bit weird. I, the, you know, I, I walked over to, to drink it and I thought, hang on a second, I've got a bottle here. What, what I've got a bottle, you know, that's normally a plastic what, cup. Plastic, what, beer or plastic? No, no, it was like a Diet Coke and I had Diet Coke okay. bottle and the lid. Look, they used they used to, when I was first growing up, they used to give us the bottle but take the lid off. Yeah. And now that and now they give us the plastic cup. So on Saturday, I was given a I was given a Diet Coke bottle with, with the lid on it, which I thought was a bit strange. Maybe they just wanted to get it you know get get people served double quick and they were just trying to do that i mean i i, I don't know um derogatory abuse or discrimination discriminate abuse i can't even fucking say the word but yeah um i'm lost on that one i don't you know, you know racism stuff like that that sort of level of abuse that that sort of discrimination re abuse and stuff like that i understand i just i don't know um Football. Uh, I don't know how you're going to take how you're going to take everything out of football. Where, where are we going to stop? Are we going to stop with you fat bastard? You fat bastard. You know who ate all the pies? Is 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 that going to be the next one eventually to go? Because we're fat shaming some poor northern fella who just happens to be at the front in an orange t-shirt. Anyone can answer that, mate. It's it's where society's moving on, though, isn't it? That's the problem. Um, well, not problem. It's just a fact. So. Yeah, I agree with you. Like the song in question was sung everywhere, and it was sung yesterday at Tottenham Chelsea. So, you know, it is a song that is common football folklore in that sense. But like I say, society's moving on in that sense, and they've got to be seen to come out and talk about it, and obviously be against it. I suppose in that sense, haven't they, the club? No, I agree. I think you know they've got to come out and talk about it. But you know, there was a hell of a lot of people singing that chant on Saturday. So, you know, realistically, are you, you're not going to ban a whole stadium of people. Um, and, and it's something what's sung to Chelsea most weeks, I think. Uh, definitely yesterday you could hear it. Um, it was definitely sang by the Spurs fans to Chelsea. Um, you know, it is, it, it is what it is. I suppose we'll move on from that because, I mean... Yeah, let's, talk down stuff. let's talk sod the down stuff. Let's talk about the good stuff, and hopefully, we get some good quality EFL content <laughs> from the club direct this time next season. So, eh? well, yeah, I mean, uh, talk about the iFollow. I mean, iFollow is a pain in the ass. 
Um, we have more problems with it than what we don't. All of us can can correspond to that. Yes, everyone's had no volume. You know, how many times this season have we had no sound? <laughs> you know, you've got you've got Carl banging on Twitter saying, uh, just to let everyone know, we're dealing with it. It'll be back on shortly, or we've got the opposition. You know, we we've got no sound. Um, I mean, Dan, you've used it as well. I mean, what's your views on on recast so far? I think we've all used it now, to be fair. So we can we can open that on there. I mean, what's your views on, on recast? Yeah, I've, I think I think it, it's okay. It does the job. Um, by the sounds of it, it's going to put revenue in the club's pocket, which is you know not a bad thing considering the last couple of years. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I assume there were teething problems. I think I said to you that the sound was a bit dodgy on my feed uh, watching the under 23s. Um, I'm not it sure. It picked up that... in the second half, though, didn't it? It was crystal yeah. clear in the second half. Yeah, so first half I had to mute it. Um, but second half. Yeah, me and you both. Yeah. To, yeah, I to do too. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's what they'll do in terms of. I'd assume it wouldn't be. I know quite a few clubs have, have taken their, their game coverage in house. Like uh, quite a few of my mates are Charlton fans. And to be fair to Charlton, their coverage of games, they've revamped and they've done quite well. They've got like a little panel before and after. And you just, I think, maybe like an hour's additional content, if that's your thing, for your tenor. But well, that's what Bristol like, do, isn't it? Bristol City do that. When we played, as well. when we played um, Bristol City, the, what was it, the other week, um, they do that. It's on Bristol City TV. So before the game, they'll have a member of the coaching team or member of the academy coaching team or whatever will sit in and there's a guy with a laptop with a, you know, like a blue screen or a TV screen behind and they have a little chat about it. And then it obviously goes off, watches watches the game and then half time you'll come back and there'll be these two talking about key points through the first half, whether that be opposition or, or um, you know, the home team. And then obviously they and then they come back and, and they do an after match analysis. I mean, that that's probably what, will be great for us because then you're getting a lot more content. Because at the moment, you pay a tenner for iFollow, or if you're overseas, you pay the money under, and I think, I think my, our, our, a friend of the show who lives out in the States, he pays 180 bucks a year for iFollow out there. But you literally get, what, 10 minutes before the game with nothing before it. You get the game footage, some commentary, and then end the game, it's gone. Half time, you just basically either have shitloads of adverts or you've just got a view down a pitch yeah there's definitely so much more that can that can be done with it um hopefully this step means that's something that the club want to do um because like you say for, for what you get i mean at the end of the day you get to watch the game but for a tenner when you've got other clubs like you say like bristol were doing that child they're doing that mm. and getting so much more for their money for me it's a, it's a no-brainer if it's something we can do and we're out of the contract and we can take it in-house and do our own thing, you know. It's costing us about 100 grand to get out of the contract. Is it? To, I think it's between, yeah, I think it's between 80 and 100 grand to get out of the contract. It's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. I, I, look, abso- absolutely a lot of money. But I think, you know, even if they went to some of you you journalist boys, like, you know, you, Alex Grace, et cetera, et cetera, and do something with you boys at half time because you're there. Mm. There's no harm in them having a microphone with a you know with a, a steady cam in front of them and just talk to you boys, what's your views, all of that. It just gives you just want a bit more interaction and people will pay for the content. I think I think people will pay to watch it. Um I don't know how many people watched or, or watched the replay or anything else. Obviously, we don't see those numbers for the Charlton game. Um, and I think the den was open for the Charlton game as well, wasn't it? I mean, you can yeah. go down there and buy a ticket as well. So I do think as long as they do the right content and they don't milk it on the pricing, then, you know, you sign up, um, you sign up, you get under credits. Um, if you want more, you can watch some adverts um, or you can pay for some more. But I, I, I think, the idea around it by sharing and and hoping people will take on, I think, works. Yeah, definitely. Like you, like you said, I know you bought the credits. I I bought a, a couple of credits just to watch the game because um, I signed up quite late. But I think you know, if you do want to do that, you can buy them. Um, I think you said you bought the fivers worth, didn't you? 
be you can do I think you can do any amount. I I just did the two quid, I think, to to literally get the game, which isn't if you're thinking about it, if you're just sitting at home and you want to watch the 23s or I don't know if they if they if they can. I'd imagine if they start streaming on their own platform away from my follow, it'll still be a tenner. I would imagine that won't change. But for, for something like the 23s, you know, it's it's a no-brainer. I don't think people are gonna and and then if people want to watch interviews with like um Gary, uh, there's a couple with uh, Nana and Benick as well. Then, you know, like you say, you can watch the videos, get the credits. And well, I think what they're doing is that you, you can get those videos on recast to start with, so a few days on there, and then they're basically be going across their social medias, hopefully. So I think right. that you know, so everyone can get access, just slight exposure. Um, the rest of the bits in the statement, I really can't be bothered to talk about because if you want to read it, read it. Um, <laughs> Long podcast really by standards today, anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is. So, um, you boys, uh, start with you, Dan. Anything you want to say while you're here before we go? I think Any so. Any other no. points? Don't think so. Kai, I'll give a quick prediction for Saturday if you want. We'll do, uh, yeah, let's do that. Let, let's, I was waiting for we'll that, go back. Dan, prediction for Saturday one all. Can't see it's getting that clean sheet, but I think. I think it'd be tight. I think it'd be cagey. I think some made a good point earlier that Forest actually play five at back as well. A lot of the games I tend to find when I'm watching five at back versus five at back end up cancelling each other out. Um, feels like a one-one. Kai, I'm gonna be really optimistic and go for the same score as Birmingham, three-one. I reckon maybe one-one at half time. We'll go for a second half and uh, nick a couple. Uh, yeah, I reckon three-one. Fingers crossed, anyway. That might be me being a bit optimistic, but we can all dream, can't we? In what la la land do you live in where it's 1 1 at half time and we're actually going to go for it in the second half? <laughs> Unless we're 1 0 at half time and then we win 3 1, I'll support that one. Um, New Year, yeah. I think it's going to be 1 1 as well. That's my prediction. I think we'll probably be. I think it'll be a close game and I think we'll probably get a late equaliser and probably want to go on to win the game and draw 1 1, I think. Yeah, um, I, I sort of agree with you boys. I think it'll probably be 1 1, but I'm going to go for 2 1. Millwall. Uh, Grabbing to score Forest goal. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, it'll be good to say Grabbing to score one of Millwall's goals as well, just to really wind him up because that would really hurt him. But no, I think it's. I think it'll probably be 1 1 or 2 1. I think so, I'm doing my um, best grabbing impression at the minute with my beard. So, you know, I'm, yeah. just, I'm really getting there. <laughs> At least having at least having air around your chin lets you talk like a cunt. So um so <laughs> there you go. One for you as well, Dan. There we go. <laughs> well, look, thanks for joining us. Bit of a ramble today. Um check out the statement, have a look at it, see what you think. Leave a leave a comment, see you know what your views are. Um you are the fans, you know, you've got a right reply. Um there is a link on the Millwall um supporters website where you can comment and, and add your views um but that's it from us just one thing before we go uh if you have been charged um for tickets um for the card for the crystal palace game um by dialing up the 0844 number or whatever number it was um if it is an exceptional charge there's a few there's there's one which is 35 quid and there's one across social media, Joe Zamperu's um, 50 quid. Uh, get in touch with the MSC or get in touch with Millwall Direct and they are looking to do credits back onto your ticket account. So, you know, thanks for the club for doing that. It's just a shame it was there beforehand. But, yeah, that's it from us. Follow us across social media. Um, make sure to subscribe to us if you're watching this on YouTube. Thanks very much for watching it. We are across Twitter, uh, Instagram and TikTok and Facebook. We use the account, which is that Millwall pod. Easy to find us. And if you want to email into the show, then that's info at that Millwall podcast.co.uk. Um, well, you've joined us for another week. Much appreciated. And we will see you after the Forest game. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>